Hello and welcome to another episode of Shattered Lives, the Irish Daily Star's crime podcast. I'm crime correspondent Michael O'Toole. Today, uh, our chief reporter and I, Paul Healy, are going to be talking about, in general, the, uh, the case of eight missing women in the Leinster area, which were subject of a guard operation called Operation Trace. But and we're going to mention some of them, all the women. But we're going to specifically be talking about one missing woman, uh, a lady called Annie McCarrick. Now it's of interest, last week was the 30th anniversary of her going missing from the South Dublin area and Gardy upgraded her case to that of murder. So that's obviously a significant development. Now Paul has been speaking to a man called Alan Bailey, a former Garda detective sergeant who was centrally involved in what is called the Serious Crime Review Team, we call it the Cold Case Unit, which was involved in Operation Trace and investigating the other women. So, Paul, we might talk briefly about the background to Annie McCarrick. Yeah, well, this is just, it's, it's worth reminding our, our listeners just to the basic facts of this case, because look, in fairness, it's been 30 years, um, and it's fresh in many people's memories because I suppose a lot of people knew Annie McCarrick, um, and she was a very popular young girl and, and went to college here, spent some time here working in a cafe. Um, so there's a lot of people that still, it sticks with them, and it has stuck with them for 30 years as to what the hell happened to her, because she literally just vanished off the face of the earth. As you mentioned at the top of, of this pod, that she's one of eight women uh, that disappeared in the so-called vanishing triangle, which we'll come back to uh, in a bit. But they're all unsolved cases. Now, some of them are slightly more uh, explainable than others, but there there are a handful there that are just totally baffling and baffling to detectives to this day. But a significant development in the case, as you said, Mick, uh, th- this was a missing persons case for, for 29 years. And on the anniversary, the guards have decided to make this major public announcement that they have upgraded to a murder investigation. Now, the guards don't do that lightly. I mean, some people might have looked at that skeptically and said, uh, this investigation is being upgraded because it's the 30th anniversary and it's all just a bit of a public media show. <clears throat> to a degree, they might have waited until the day of uh, to, to, to give it a bit of a show, yes. But the guards, if they're upgrading this to a murder investigation, then they have uh, credible evidence that this uh, lady, Annie, Annie McCarrick, is sadly no longer with us and that, and that she is not responsible for her own disappearance, that there is a third party involvement. Um, and indeed media reports have stated and we are led to believe that there has been new significant evidence given to the Gardaí um, in, in, in recent, we don't know how long they've had this information, but there is new information that the guards are now following up on in relation to this disappearance. But just to go back to the beginning, uh, Annie McCarrick is an American citizen. She was from Long Island in New York, uh, born on the 21st of March, 1966. And she's the only child of Nancy and John McCarrick. Uh, Nancy uh, is still alive. Her husband sadly passed away a number of years ago. <clears throat> she went missing on the 26th of March, 1993. Um, uh, now she had prior to that spent a number of years here in Ireland she she supposedly fell in love with the country after coming here in 1987 on a school trip and she spent a bit of time here going to St. Patrick's College from Condra and she was also in Maynooth went back to New York and then she came back to Ireland in uh, on the 4th of January 1993 and she was renting out an apartment there in Sandymount with a couple of friends she also worked in Cafe Java there on Leeson Street, and uh, she, she also was a waitress in, uh, in another restaurant in Donnybrook. So she was quite well known around Dublin. She had a lot of friends, and she was very active, uh, it, it had an active friend group across South uh, Dublin. Um, so it was on that Friday, the 26th of March, um, that, that she had spoken to her flatmates and uh, she had expressed a desire to go to the Wicklow Mountains. She wanted to go out for a walk. Now, this was kind of a spurn of the moment type of thing. There was no indication that this was like a well-planned event, that this is something that she'd been talking about for days. She had supposedly said to a friend, I'm looking to go up to Enniscary, would you like to come with me? And a friend said to her, this friend had, had hurt her ankle or something like that and said she wasn't able to go with her. So Annie went on her own on a bus to Enniscary Um The last proper, like, undisputed sighting of her is at an AIB branch in Sandymount, uh, which is just before 11 o'clock in the morning. And the reason why we can say this is the last proper confirmed sighting of her is because there's CCTV footage of this. And people might recall when they saw the news there on Friday uh, about the the 
uh, case being upgraded, the guards have, have reissued uh, a photographic still from the CCTV footage of Annie at this AIB bank. And it's an image of her with this brown satchel bag that she had with her. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But as I said, she was telling her friends that she was going to Enniskerry. And there is a friend or a girl who knew her who has stated that she saw Annie getting onto that bus going to Enniskerry. So the theory is that she got off this bus at Enniskerry about half one or so and would have been in and around that area kind of mid to late afternoon. That is really the last we can say of her probably accurate movements. There is then another sighting, alleged sighting, of Annie up at the famous Johnny Fox's pub uh, up there in Glen Cullen. Now that's about a six kilometre distance from where she would have gotten off the bus in Enniskerry. Um And uh, there, there's been some dispute as to whether she could have made it up there, walked up there. Um, uh, but there is a doorman who was working there. His name is Sam Doran, and he recalls seeing Annie McCarrick coming into. There was a ho- a hooli event happening. This was apparently a regular thing, and apparently Annie didn't realise that she would have to pay entry. And there was uh, supposedly a couple in front of her and a man who said uh, that he would pay uh, for Annie to gain entry. Um, as we'll, we'll come to the interview that I did with with uh, for the, the former uh, de- Detective Sergeant Alan Bailey, who, who thoroughly investigated this case. But he told me that this doorman, um, who I have tried to track down and speak to, but he, he says this this individual, Sam Doran, is adamant to this day that he saw Annie McCarrick. And he says, look, Annie was a good looking girl. And she stood out and he has a very clear memory of seeing Annie McCarrick. Now, others have disputed and said he must be mistaken about this because it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up because there is then a huge time gap, about a six hour period of time where we don't know where Annie McCarrick is. We know she got off the bus and then she's supposedly all the way up here at the Johnny Fox's pub. And we can't account for her movements in these missing hours. And that could be the key to solving the whole case. Where was she in those hours? But uh, that is the last reported sighting of her it's a little bit more shaky as to whether we can believe uh that it was because the the doorman obviously mr joran obviously sincerely believes he saw annie mccarrick but it's different from the bus sighting in that it was a girl who actually knew annie personally that saw her getting onto that bus so that's the difference between those two sightings but just one point just to say we can say with certainty that alan bailey who I mean, I've known for a long time, he's an excellent detective and he's an excellent reader of people. And he firmly believes that Mr. Doran believes he's telling the truth. Exactly. Yes. Um, I suppose that is different from saying he categorically believes that it was Annie McCarrick. But, you know, it's important that this witness to this day is adamant about what he saw. And so it can't, I, I don't think it can be completely dismissed. But look, there have been multiple investigations and theories in relation to this. And I'll just mention one. There was a, a, a uh, investigation that took place in America uh, by a New York-based lawyer named Michael Griffith. Uh, and he announced that he was investigating the case Um and he doesn't believe the Johnny Fox's sighting happened. Based, well, he, he he believes that the doorman may be mistaken. Um, and, and he has indicated that he has his own theory about perhaps somebody that Annie was dating at the time. Uh, something about that it surrounds that theory. There's also another theory which has only come to light this year in relation to an alleged serial killer, a uh, Spanish serial killer named Antonio Angle. Uh, who Alan Bailey had confirmed to me was investigated as a potential suspect in this case. And Mr. Angles was effectively on the run and Gardy had intelligence or had learned uh, that he supposedly came into Dublin port in and around that time on a ship. Um, But the thing is, this was thoroughly investigated and the guards and and Alan told me this never came across any definitive evidence that Antonio Angles was ever in the country. And there's even a theory that he... uh, may have jumped off the boat and drowned that he may no longer even be with us but he is obviously a serious suspect because he is a a suspected serial killer the other major suspect in this is larry murphy and we can go into a bit of detail about larry murphy obviously you've been reporting on larry murphy probably your whole career now mick yeah Um, but the reason why Larry obviously is a suspect is because of his modus operandi um, in that you know, he was jailed in January 2001. He kidnapped and uh, uh, you know, attempted uh, 
uh, he repeatedly raped, uh, attempted to murder a young woman from Carlow uh, in the Wicklow Mountains. That was in February 2000. And, you know, during that ordeal, he, he locked her in the in the boot of his car and he raped her and subjected her to an ordeal where the guards do believe had uh, two people not intervened and, and come across this horrific scene uh, that that woman would have been murdered. And, and I think in my interview with Alan Bailey, he did say that he believes that woman would no longer be with us and probably would never have even been found were it not for that chance encounter by those two individuals. Yes, they were two hunters. And my memory is he was in the process of strangling her with an item of her own clothing when the hunters came along. And one of them, because it was that area, <coughs> sort of with Wicklow, you know, that area, one of them recognised him and he, and, he, and he did a runner. And the guards went to him the next day and he was nice and calm and matter of fact and, and he was arrested. But he was seconds, it's probably fair to say, from killing that woman. So, I mean, there's no doubt that Larry Murphy's, and we can talk, we're going to talk about the other missing women because there's, he was, there was a, fa- yeah, there was a, fa- a file sent to the Director of Public Prosecutions in relation to one of the missing men, women about Larry Murphy, but the DPP decided no charge. But this man is a very, very dangerous man. He would have killed that woman. He's a suspect in at least one other murder. So, you know, it's only reasonable because it, it, that is his rough area. So it's only reasonable and that the guards would look at him. And I think there's also something just from memory that I think the person who the doorman said you offered to pay for Miss McCarrick into the hooli, I think there was a, he matched the description of Murphy. You know, it, it wasn't. Uh, yes, there know, was. There was an E photo fit where uh, Alan Bailey did say to me it was a very badly drawn drawing at the time. But yes, if you compare that to a photograph of Larry Murphy, there are some striking similarities. Yeah, you're right. So, you know, he is going to be lifted. But before we, maybe we might talk about more about Alan Bailey, we might talk about the other missing women. There is, sorry, Mick, but there is one other suspect I want to talk about before we come oh, to Oh, sorry, that. go on. Um, there is also an alleged uh, member of the IRA uh, who is a suspect in the disappearance of Annie McCarrick. And this is an individual who we can't identify. Um, but in relation to that, this individual has been looked at as a suspect as well. And the story goes, the alleged story goes, that uh, Annie had an encounter with this individual and that this individual may have overshared about his, uh, let's say, extracurricular activities. And that there might have been a fear then that Annie uh, would squeal or would tell somebody uh, something that she shouldn't. And that this individual, um, un- unfortunately, sadly, murdered her uh, as a result of, of a slip of the tongue uh, thing that he, he said. That's something, obviously, the guards are going to have to look at as well. And as you said, Mick, you know, they're going to have to speak to Larry Murphy. They're going to have to speak to this individual as well. Now, perhaps the guards have a, have a definitive line of inquiry. As I said, there is new information that's come to light. But in any investigation, especially a brand new murder investigation, they're going to look at every angle again, aren't they? And they're going to have to talk to these people, uh, if not just to rule them out. Yes, and we'll hear from Alan, but he was talking about how he went into RBL prison to talk to Larry Murphy as he was serving uh, 15 years, I think it was, for attempted murder, rape and attempted murder of the lady in Carlo. And he tried to speak to him and he wouldn't speak to him. But back in the day, and he makes this point in the interview, back in the day... You know, once he said, no, I don't want to talk to you, that was really it. But guards now have this power called the Section 42 warrant. They can go into prison, take somebody out from prison and arrest them because they're in the custody of the prison service. So there is that mechanism now. I think it's probably fair to say, just reading all the rooms, that this IRA man is probably the strongest suspect of everybody. At, from what we understand, we're always on the outside and we never really know what what is happening. But just reading the rooms, the indications are... There's a very strong interest in in that man, and I believe he's living actually in America, which is a bit of a coincidence. But just from what I see, he seems to be, you know, the focus of the inquiry. Not really in anybody else, but there is a strong. Let's say there is a strong interest, a stronger interest in him than than most of, than any other man, really, even Larry Murphy. Yes, and I I think you know maybe early on there was a fear that Larry Murphy or indeed another individual was acting uh, in effect as a, like a serial killer um, and we'll come to this now with when you want to speak about these these eight women because it's important to you know Alan Bailey did say to me that when they were setting up this cold case unit whilst they did look at these cases individually they were also looking at the possibility um, that one person that a serial killer was responsible for all 
of them, all eight of them, or at least a portion of them. And that's why it became known as this vanishing triangle, because all these women went missing in this particular area of Leinster, which coincided with with locations where Larry Murphy potentially could have been. And they were seriously looking at him as a potential serial killer. I, I do have a list here. I think we should go through them. I think at this stage, in, in most cases... Gardy would have a very strong belief who was responsible for each either disappearance or murder. So we'll, we'll go through them. It was set up, it was Operation Trace, set up by at this, so far, how far back it was, it was in late 1999, it was set up by then Garda Commissioner Pat Byrne and, and was to establish all these missing women. So Fiona Pender, who was 25, went missing from Offaly in 1996. Now, um, she was heavily pregnant and there was a dig operation for any trace of Miss Pender in Offaly a couple of years ago and I remember being down at the scene there was a great level of disappointment amongst the guards because I think they were convinced effectively somebody had come forward about a man who's living outside the area now to say that he had indicated that Miss Pender was buried in a certain part of, of County Offaly and there was a very very significant dig but they didn't find her so that so Fiona Pender is one, but you know that there's a suspect for that. Deirdre Jacob, who was an 18 year old student teacher, she went missing uh, in July 1998. She was abducted outside her house. Um, we've been to the house. The, the, the lovely people, uh, the, the 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 Jacob family. Now, like uh, Annie McCarrick, that case was upgraded to murder, even though it was a, a, a missing case, missing person case. That was upgraded to murder. The, the, uh, Murphy was identified as the suspect, and as I said, uh, there was a file sent to the DPP. The guards were hopeful of a charge in that case, but just, I think it was last year, the DPP decided that there wasn't enough uh, evidence. Essentially, one of the main planks of evidence was uh, Murphy is alleged to have told an, another inmate in Arbor Hill Prison that he abducted Deirdre, hit her with a hammer, Put her in the back of in the, the seat well of his front seat well of his car and then get abducted and, and killed her. Then there's a lady called Fiona Sinnott from Bridge. I, I recall, sorry, just in speaking about Deirdre Jacob, you know, I mean, Larry Murphy was a serious suspect in relation to that, so much so, as you said, that it. That, that, oh, yeah. Uh, and I believe he was interviewed in relation to it. Am I right? I believe they went. They the the certainly there were stories, but I I can recall being told that the guards did go over and speak to him uh, in an unofficial capacity in the UK where he's now residing. Um, yeah, I I, I think so. I, I think so because remember the guards don't have power to arrest anybody outside the jurisdiction, so they have to go over and try and talk to them voluntarily. But you know, they have spoken to Murphy an awful lot in prison and outside. So yeah, yeah, I, no, I do think that they had to. Uh, they did try and go and talk to him. I don't know if he spoke to them or I don't know if he did it, if he gave any answers, but I'd, I'd be pretty happy that they did speak to him. So he was the suspect there. So in that case, Gardy would believe that Larry Murphy was involved in the murder, abduction and murder of Deirdre Jacob. So we know that in Fiona Penda there's a suspect. We know that in Deirdre Jacob there's a suspect. Fiona Sinnott is a 19-year-old teenager from Bridgetown in Wexford and she was last seen in February 1998. No remains have ever been found. That has not been up upgraded to murder, but there is a suspect in that case. Then uh, Kira Breen, who was another teenager, she slipped out of a house. She was living in Dundalk in County Louth and she slipped out of a house to meet somebody in the middle of the night and she was never seen since. That was not upgraded to murder, but Gardy did again search for her body and uh, Pat Murray, who's a legendary former detective inspector, was uh, leading that investigation and he cordoned off an area of Dundalk just uh, near the train station in Dundalk. And there was a very significant search there. And I think it's one of the greatest disappointments in Pat's career. He has spoken about this, that they didn't find the body because they do they did believe her body was there. But then the suspect uh, himself later died. So then there's Annie McCarrick. Then there's a lady called Eva Brennan, who was 40, and she uh, disappeared from Terra Neur in South Dublin in July 1993. Um, now, she had, been, she had mental health issues, but her family are convinced that she was killed, that something happened to her. Now, there is no suspect in that case, which is one of the few. Jojo Dollard, 21-year-old, disappeared in 1995. And now, that was in Moon, in, in Moon. I think that's in County Kildare. She was hitchhiking home from Dublin to Kilkenny. Uh, she was using a pay phone. Um, there, there were a couple of suspects. Murphy was looked at that. Another uh, infamous sex criminal called Simon McGinley, who, Paul, you, you chased down, was it late last year? He was uh, officially classed as a person of interest in that Jojo Dullard case. But that case has been upgraded in murder. 
my understanding is they have a suspect and it's not McGinley, it's not Murphy, it's a man who they have been looking at for quite a long time. So that's upgraded to murder, so there's a, a suspect there. Then there's a lady called Amelda, Amelda Keenan. She was 23. She uh, disappeared in Waterford City in January 1994, and there's no suspect in that. So I think in all of them, in the majority of those cases, there is a suspect, and really, Murphy is only the suspect, the nailed on suspect, shall we say, for Tato Jacob. I think with most of the other cases, Gardy do believe they know who was involved in the disappearances, and it's not him. Yeah, and I think the guards are probably more hopeful than ever that they can maybe help solve some of these cases. Uh, you know, then they have a better chance of solving some of these cases under certain circumstances than before, and that's because of the emergence of DNA evidence, which is now so good. And, and you'll hear from Alan Bailey about this bag and I mean it's only when we spoke about it that it makes complete sense because as part of this new Garda appeal there's a particular focus on that brown satchel bag that Annie McCarrick had it's never been recovered and and obviously the guards believe if they recovered an item of that nature um, they could potentially recuperate some DNA evidence which may lead them to her killer um, now Alan Bailey believes it hasn't shown up because potentially the killer kept it as a souvenir that's his own professional theory and we have to bear in mind that he investigated this case quite thoroughly and he believes it may well have been kept as, as a souvenir but if they recover that bag they, they could recuperate some dna evidence and that is something that certainly alan bailey and detectives prior to him they just didn't have the luxury of that and and one thing also yes and it's a very good point about people keep uh, killers keeping mementos it's not beyond the realms of possibility but one one point about this you know anime carrick was 30 years ago we have had, you know, cases, say, for example, a lady called Irene White, who was horrifically murdered in Dundalk in County Louth in 2005. Now, there's, there are two men serving life for that murder, but that was cracked because a woman came forward maybe 10 years after the murder. So people do change and people sometimes aren't in a position for out of fear or whatever to talk to Gardy. But, you know, time does change things. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that there are people with information about all these cases who may now feel that the time is right to come forward. So that's one of the reasons that they appeal. And I can understand why the Gardy announced the Annie McCarrick case was a murder on her anniversary. You know, there is impact there. I mean, that, there's no there's no harm in that. I mean, they're, they're trying to solve a murder here. So, you know, let them out. But it's not... Some people do have, you know, conscious consciences. And, you know, things do get to them. And sometimes after a certain amount of time, they do feel as if they can't talk. So, you know, people may come forward. It's, it's you know, it's possible. It's likely. It's, it's Maybe it's there, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's not the only case uh, in that week, you know, that has taken over 30 years to, to, to get to a, a, a conclusive point. So it's it's never too late, you know? But um, I think I think we will we'll turn now to the interview with Alan. Uh, I, I I conducted this interview uh, earlier this week with, with Alan Bailey, but this is the first time anyone can 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 hear it. Um, and I think it's just important for people to hear, you know, Alan's perspective on this and his expertise on this. But also, you know, he was quite honest with me in that. You know, he feels it's one of the great failings in his life that he wasn't able to solve this case. And, you know, my heart goes out to him in that because he quite clearly invested a lot of time and energy in relation to this. And he just hopes now that this this new case will finally resolve matters. So thanks for listening to us. We'll turn over now to the interview with Alan. Alan, thank you for speaking to me. Just for, for listeners who aren't maybe fully aware of who you are, you were you were a, a, a member of Angard Shiakana and you were involved in, in, in the cold case Unit who were investigating many cases, Jojo Dullard and, and Annie McCarrick being examples. But just in your own words, sorry to, to, to describe to people what it is that you what you did with Angard Shia Khanna. I was, I was uh, in the Gardaí, I served in the Gardaí for 49 years. Yes. Uh, the majority of that was spent in the investigation of serious crime. In 1998, I was appointed to a, a specialist task force to. Uh, we're looking at an investigation, investigations into the disappearance of a number of females in the eastern seaboard of Ireland. Uh, mm. I served as national co- coordinator on that task force for 13 years. And then um, in 2007, I was appointed as SARS in the charge of the Garda Cold Case Unit. Yes. Uh, once it was set up. And so... E- 
your involvement in that would have meant that you would have been looking at these cases from from ground zero. You would have began at, at the very beginning of of everything and 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 looked at it from from the moment, as for example, the case of Annie McCarrick, which we're speaking about today. I mean, you would have looked at uh, from the from the very last sighting of her right up to whatever stage the original investigation would be. Is that right? Or just to tell us how that would work. Right. Uh, there, was a, there was a total of six Gardaí appointed to the task force. Mm-hmm. And we had six cases. We were each given the case to start with, and we then moved on to the next case. So by the end of our our study period, as you call it, we were all acquainted with all six of the missing person cases that were tasked with looking at. These included Annie McCarrick, Peter Jacob, Giorgio Dollard, mm. and a, a number of other girls also. And it was kind of, it was kind of colloquially referred to like as a, it was a, almost a triangle. Is that right? Of of That's right. the the area which went missing, it stretched from Tonnemore across the Dundalk in mm. the north and to Wexford in the east, and mm. it's known colloquially as the vanishing triangle yeah. because females over a number of years that had disappeared in that area. Yeah. And I mean, you were investigating each of these cases separately, is that right? But did, did, did you just come to uh, to any sort of suspicion well, that they were perhaps linked? What, yeah, what we were, th- what we were tasked with was examining all six cases individually and right. then to get to assess if there's any commonality between the cases. Now, what were, that's police speak for we're looking to see was there a serial killer involved in the disappearance of all six of, of the victims. Yeah. Um, uh, after, after a number of years on the squad, I can say that we were satisfied that in at least three of the cases, the, the girls knew the, per- the perpetrator, the person who abducted and killed them, because we had no doubt that these girls weren't just missing, they were actually murder cases. Uh, and I mean, I, I could keep you all day, but I don't know. I don't want to go into the ins and outs of it, the complications of, a, of an investigation. But what, what, what? I suppose drew you to that conclusion that at least three of them knew uh, their killers, as you said. Yeah, we, yeah, we were satisfied that we we could identify the person involved in the abduction and murder of these three men. It was a person that was known to them, but not known to one another, as in. Uh, um, an individual guard like Fiona Sinnott down in Wexford. Yes. We, we were satisfied that we could bring that as far as we could with, without having the actual evidence enough to bring him to court. But we were satisfied we could say who the person, the male, it was, who was involved with her disappearance and date. Right. Similarly, similarly with Fiona Pender and Tonner Moore. Yes. We could also say the same. And Pierre Breen and Dundalk. Right. But in, in the cases of... Jodo Dullard and 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 indeed uh, this case that we're speaking about Annie McCarrick. Yeah, we 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 were never able to, uh, to uh, identify any one particular suspect. Right. There were, number, there were a number of persons of interest who came, you know, during the course of the investigation, their names and roles, they were looked at. But again, yeah, I don't see any evidence. Yeah. The staff, the weren't charged them with. And look, I'm going to go through in the podcast the details of you know the history of the of, of Annie McCarrick and 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 yeah. what the known facts. So I don't propose to go through all that with you here. But effectively, you investigated this from the um, from the very beginning, and you investigated the um, the allegation that she was on this bus to Enniskerry, and then the alleged sighting at Johnny Fox's. So you would have spoken to all of these people that that would have said that they that they witnessed that they saw Annie McCarrick in these locations. That's correct, yeah. And are you yourself satisfied that she was on the bus to Enniskerry, that she was definitely going in that direction that day? I, I have no doubt have the support to the witness that Annie was on that bus. Right. On the, the, problem, the problem that we, we encountered in the investigation was that if Annie arrived at Enniskerry village sometime around 1 p.m. on the 26th of February, of March. Right. Uh, and the next sighting in them would have been at Johnny Fox's, which is some miles from in a scary village. Yeah. And at half seven at night. So, so there's it's a. Those, it's those missing hours that are relevant and uh, that are important yeah. in the investigation. And we could never establish 
we only went during that, during that time. So it's it's a it's a mystery. There's a, there's a, a solid six hours. Am I right there? Where we don't we can't account for her, her movements. And we do we do we do we do. We were satisfied that Annie did not deliberately leave. As in, there's no push pull factor uh, identified. A push pull is very important in an investigation. It means that if someone leaves home because of something that's going on at home, or maybe because. They fall in love and left with a new lover or something like that. But in any case, there's nothing established to suggest that she left of her own free will. Right. Um, you obviously spoke to the doorman, uh, Sam Doran, who 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 said that he saw Annie in Johnny Fox's. Are you satisfied that 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 because I mean, there has been some doubt thrown over whether she was up at Johnny Fox's at all? Do you believe? Well, I, I'm satisfied that, that the witness at, at Johnny Fox is, is convinced himself that he was right. Right. He came out of his own free will, and to this day he has stood by his information that Annie McCarrick entered the pub that he saw her and identified her straight away. Annie was a very good looking girl. The girl that stood out. So he, and he is quite satisfied. Now, unfortunately, the one thing we don't have that you would have nowadays. You know, you know CCTV. Mm-hmm. No, I, there's not a pub in the Ireland nowadays that would not CCTV footage of their clients going in and out. Unfortunately, back in the day, that didn't exist. No, and I mean, she was seen in the company of a male. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Has and that I, male's identity ever been established? No, no, and uh, no, and it was unusual in that the, the the doorman recalled that. The, the lady who he said was Annie McCarrick entered and was walking in past him when he said it to her it was a cover charge and that the male behind her said look I'll get that right they, were, they didn't appear to be together until that but it, it, what's unusual about it is that no couple has ever come forward to say that was us and that was us maybe on a different night nothing like that and it stood there and stood the test of time and nobody's come forward to mm. dispute but you, in your mind, you're, are you still convinced that's a legitimate sighting um, and that it should be taken as seriously as the sighting on the bus, for example? Well, the, the one on the bus, I, I'm quite satisfied that the one on the bus is genuine because the lady who made us say he was, had worked with Annie in some of the restaurants in town and she could uh, pinpoint that day because the day she came back to visit her mother who was in hospital on well. So, I mean, she was adamant with her days. And equally so, the man at, at the Pope, the, the doorman in the Pope is adamant of what he says he saw, he did see. I mean, these people would have no reason to tell lies, but it's mm-hmm. just, as I say, there is this lacuna, this, this, this gap between Enniscary, the bus to Enniscary, and uh, Johnny Fox's Pope. And it's, we've never been able to establish where if that was Annie Pierce, you spent those few hours. Right. Uh, so we, we, we were satisfied that she didn't intend staying out. She went into the shop in Sandy Mud, yeah. into the supermarket, bought uh, food that she intended to cook you up to make um, schools, to bring into the shop, she, the restaurant she worked in, the following morning. So the ingredients for them were in the bag inside the door, along with ingredients for a meal that she was planning for the following night for some of her friends and from what we can make out after she left the pub she went or the shop in Sandywood she went to the bank she then went back to the to her apartment in Sandywood but on the way back she saw the bus that would take her to uh, up to Randall I think where she get the in the scary bus she saw that pulling up she ran to the house dropped the groceries inside the door and ran away leave the groceries just inside she certainly did, never intended to leave them there over the weekend. Mm. It's, it's, it's strange that, yeah, I, I just, <laughs> there's a lot of unanswered questions there, isn't there? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, we also established that Annie had contacted a female friend of hers and r- that morning and said, look, I have an hour or two to spare. I'm going to go for a walk around in scary. This was a regular field, uh, um trip that Annie took with her friend hmm. but unfortunately her friend had slipped and twisted her ankle and was unable to walk 
so much yet. When Annie heard that, she said, look, I wrote for a step, I wrote for a low. Mm. So that, way, that was that kind of spur of the moment. It wasn't a planned trip. Interesting. And then, obviously, now we've got this this new, it's been upgraded to a murder investigation, which is something you've been calling for for a long time. But It is. We, we, in the reports that we submitted in the year 2001 and 2002, we recommended that all the cases we were investigating mm. be upgraded to a murder as opposed to a missing person. And is that on the basis of the fact that, look, uh, uh, with everything that you established, that she wouldn't have been someone that would have disappeared on her own, um, and and she had she had her mother coming over and uh, pe- commitments that were obvious that led you to the the only conclusion is that she didn't disappear by her own hand. That's correct, Paul. Yeah, and that, and to this day, I'm sad to say, I'm convinced of that. Right. You've obviously looked at a lot of suspects. Did, did, did you have, uh, I don't know whether you have in your head a, a number of people. How, how many people did you look at, I suppose, as, as potential suspects? There's a large number of suspects. Yeah. People with convictions for sex-related crimes living in the area, they would have been one of the first people you look at. And then other people come in, come in they'd be nominated by uh, people or they'd be, they'd, because of uh, an interview that you something that uh, stories you weren't quite happy with they'd all become persons of interest there are still a number of persons of interest outstanding and, and such time as they're all eliminated mm. they remain but they, they, that, that's they never um, never any evidence established to say that so and so and so or so and so was actually responsible for Annie's disappearance and death yeah uh, one name that's constantly coming up f- for obvious reasons is is Larry Murphy. Is he an individual that she's looked at as a as a potential suspect? No, yeah, Larry Murphy. Uh, the alarm bells rang when Larry Murphy committed the crime for which he was arrested back in the year two thousand mm-hmm. because motor operandi that was used. A, a, a girl stashed off the side of the road, and on the, without the intervention, the timely intervention of two strangers, I have no doubt that girl would be dead. And we never found her body. So, yeah, given all that, we certainly had a close look at Larry Murphy. Now, Larry Murphy's in custody. We went up to Arbor Hill Prison to interview him. Mm. He refused to be interviewed. And unfortunately, as the law stood at that stage, you could, that was the end of it. Uh, nowadays, you'd go to court to get a warrant and bring him out to actually interview him. But back then, it was, if he, if he uh, agreed to be interviewed, he could be. Otherwise, no. So Larry Murphy's actually never been spoken to about this, as far as no. you're aware. No, and he, re- he, he certainly, on the such time he's eliminated or otherwise, he remains a person of interest to the investigation. So is it your hope now that, with the information that you know, I mean, maybe the guards investigating now have new information, but do you think, yeah. do you think that he is somebody that still needs, Larry Murphy is someone that the guards still need to speak to They need about this uh, this particular case? He said they needs to, to, to be in. Uh, Traced, interviewed, and eliminated. It's referred to as TIE, T I E. Yeah. And then he's, that certainly needs to be done. If he's not in it, I'd be afraid to kind of fix my, all my eggs in one basket, but he certainly has to be eliminated or, or otherwise. Yeah. <coughs> Would he have been, I, I hesitate to use this phrase, but would he have been your number one suspect? Or did you have any one particular suspect that you thought that may be the guy? Well, well look, we had an, an abduction in a Carlow town in, in 8 o'clock at night of a female, and that went completely under the radar. Nobody knew at such time as she was rescued. No one knew she'd even gone missing. Mm. And where it, had she not been rescued, I thought that she would be dead now. So uh, you have to look at it. That modus operandi, how, it, how he carried out that crime, what he did, and the attempts he made to get rid of the, the witness. I say to myself, well, he certainly has to be interviewed and eliminated or otherwise. Right. One last thing I want to ask you, just the, 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 the guards that have now upgraded the case to murder, they in particular made an appeal about the brown bag that uh, Annie had with her. Yeah. As a former guard yourself, have you read into that any more than the obvious? Uh, to, you know, why, why are they focusing on that, I suppose? Well, but on today's standards, you see that that bag, which, if it was located at the time, 
would be considered not to have uh, not to be on anything of evidential value. You know, mm. you could you would be looking for fingerprints. The best you'd hope for is blood stains, but nowadays that guy would have DNA on it, and you're looking at that. I mean, something like that would be a, a gold mine <laughs> in evidential terms. And and they think there's a possibility that there's a chance of, of recuperating that. Yeah, well, it, it, it would appear that it may be kept as a souvenir by, by her assailant. What brings you to that conclusion? Yeah, if you take it that, if, uh, that Annie was snatched off the side of the road or went, didn't go over her own free will, well, the chances that that person who took her would be able to take, snatch Annie and hold on to her bag and all that are slim. But the fact that the bag still, still remains missing would suggest that if she was taken and the bag wasn't disposed of, that it was kept as a souvenir by her assailant. That's very interesting. So, I mean, find the bag, you find her, potentially. Well, I'm not saying to find it, but certainly find the bag, you have some hope, maybe. Yeah. Get the lead to the crime. With the DNA evidence. It's fascinating. Well, obviously, like for you personally, what will it mean to have this case solved I mean it's out of your hands now and I'm sure you investigated thoroughly and it was probably frustrating for you that you didn't get the answers yeah it's, it's a one regret I have that in the, in the, of the six cases we weren't able to bring closure to the families and we did take on the other cases and we were successful in them other missing persons but those six individual cases and uh, whilst we can we can go to the families and say look in three of them this we're satisfied this is the person who killed your daughter by your sibling or whatever, mm. we just can't, we we can't be into court. Yeah. So for so so it is is it difficult for you personally that you didn't get to that point? Unfortunately, for it is it is of course it's it's, yeah. it's a failure as an investigator on my part, and it's something I had to live with. Right. Well, I imagine you're quite hopeful now that the, uh, the detectives are, are are taking I suppose twenty something years later, but they are taking your advice seriously in that they've upgraded it to a murder investigation. I am, and my years in the cold case, you were subsequently have convinced me that you should never say never. So, Paul, that was really really interesting interview you carried out with Alan Billy. What were your top takeaways from it? Well, I it's just as I, as I mentioned on a personal basis, I I, I feel quite sorry and sad for Alan in that, in that he quite, you know, as I said, he invested many years investigating this. And But there there are key elements in this case, as I mentioned, the bag, the DNA, that's a huge part. And those missing six hours that he mentions uh, are potentially, you know, the keys to un- un- unlocking this case. You know, it's also, it's apparent that a lot of people loved and knew Annie, um, you know, and, as, and there's still a lot of people out there trying to have this case resolved. Um, I just think, you know, like like Alan makes the point that, you know, he was calling for this case to be upgraded to a murder investigation for over 20 years. And that was a source of frustration for him. But maybe now this is a, an opportunity for, you know, a new breed of Garda, I suppose. And with the new tools that they have, like the DNA evidence, um, to bring this to, to a conclusion. Was that new took away from it? I, 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 I would agree with you. And just um, just about his regrets about not nailing the killer. We often think that guards are, you know, machines, but, you know, there there are always cases that stick with guards and this one clearly sticks with Alan Bailey. So just, and just, I'm really interested in the advances and if anybody does know something that have been holding the secrets for 30 years, maybe now is the time to come forward. Okay, so that was really interesting. I think, so this is going to be coming out very soon. I think, will we do uh, another review of the week? Because they are very popular and we have to keep our customers happy. Let's see. Well, we'll never do one in Thursday. Okay, thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you.